to welcome you all to the online lecture series as presented by Intersections. The purpose of this online lecture series being addressing young minds of scholars, academicians, and mostly PG students to bring about an awareness of the recent and ongoing studies in the sphere of academics. We have come a long way that provided copious vistas and perspectives to aspiring scholars. This online lecture series commenced on 14th of July, 2020. And since then, there have been almost 14 esteemed lect lectures by esteemed speakers touching upon topics like Gandhi's Hind Swaraj, representation of women in global politics, disciplining queerness through social media, workshop on memory studies and medical humanities, workshop on creative writing, so on and so forth, that yielded an insight to all of us. Today, being the concluding session, we have among us an esteemed speaker, Professor Vivek Sachdeva, who is presently up in GGS, Indraprasth University, New Delhi. Sir worked on the adaptation of Ruth Pravar Jabbala's novels into films by Merchant Ivory Productions. He is a translator and an occasional poet. He is also interested in exploring further dimensions of the relationship between literature and cinema. So without further delay, I, on behalf of Intersections, welcome you, sir. Before we begin, I have a few requests for the participants. Participants are requested to put the questions in the chat box. All the questions will be read out by me in a chronological order in the question and answer session that shall be conducted post lecture. I also humbly request all the participants to mute themselves and not to share the screen. Thank you. Once again, I welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vesaki, and uh, thank you, Vivek Singh, for inviting me. It's a, it's a good initiative that you have taken that you have conducted so many lectures in the times of COVID-19, which keeps you all intellectually busy, engaged, and creative. <clears throat> uh, without much ado about anything, I, I would like to begin with my talk. Uh, before I formally begin, let me give you uh, just a small caution that the topic which has been assigned to me for today, that is film studies and narratology, this topic perhaps cannot be summed up in, in one hour talk. Because if I talk about film narration, that generally takes me more than two hours, I take two to three hours to finish this topic. And simultaneously, I take two hours at least to talk about different aspects of narratology. So what in this small talk I'll do, uh, I'll focus on one particular aspect of uh, narratology and see its relationship with, with, with films, that how uh, we can understand certain concepts of narratology in relation to films. Before we begin with narratology, the study of narrative, we must understand what narratology is. Am I audible? First of all, tell me. Or should I raise my voice? Yes, sir, you're, yes, sir, you're audible. Fine, thank you. The question is, what is narratology? Is narratology the theory of narratives? Is it just a study of narratives or it is something else? Well, no doubt it deals with the study of narratives, but it is certainly not the theory of narratives. 
it is just a theory of narrative. When I say it is a theory of narrative, I mean to say the ways to talk about narratives. There are different ways to study narratives. And the school of narratology is just one of them. Uh, organizer, I would like to, uh, yes, I can share screen from my side. Fine, thank you. Can, can you uh, see the screen? Yes, sir. Fine, thank you. So, narratology is not the theory of narrative, it is but a theory. Because different theoreticians, like as, as the slide shows you, they have used different terms for it. Somebody has called it poetics of narrative, somebody has called it rhetorical narratives, someone has called it grammar of narrative, Gerard Jenner has called it method, method of narrative, or study of narrative discourse. But the question is, what is narrative? Before we study narrative, uh, narratives in narratology, we need to understand what is narrative. Now, narrative in simple terms means event or events. That becomes the first question for us to engage with. Because these days the word narrative is used very, very liberally. You watch any news channel and they will say that the, the narrative of this story has changed and the narrative of that issue has changed. Narrative of Sushant Singh Rajput's death has changed. The narrative of Indian politics has changed. The narrative of Indian diplomacy has changed. But they're not wrong. They are talking about certain narratives. But are they talking about literary narrative? Are they talking about cinematic narratives? No, they are not. It means what is narrative? Narrative means wherever we find a story, that is a narrative. Then what makes a story? So another fundamental question is, suppose, we, suppose I say that the queen died. If I say the queen died, does it mean it's a full story? Or it's simply, I'm, I'm simply stating a fact or I'm making a statement. Then perhaps I may say the king died and out of grief the queen also died. Now in this case, there are two events. And these two events are connected to each other through the, through the logic of cause, cause and effect, the causality. That becomes important. If causality is important, then two events are connected to each other through a logical connection, which makes it a narrative. Yes. So, another complex uh, expansion of the same would be that the king went to a war, the king died in a war, and the queen died out of, her, out of grief. Now, I am developing those events that why did the king die and how the queen died. So we are now expanding the narrative. I belong to that school of thought, which believes that at least there should be, at least there should be two events in order to make it a narrative. And those events are connected to each other through cause and effect. And whenever events are connected to each other, whenever events happen, they happen in time and space. So time, space, and causality, these three terms become very important for us to understand the nature of narrative. Then there are different kinds of narratives. As I was telling you that there are narratives in, uh, in the news channels, then there are narratives in the, in the courts of law, then there are literary narratives, there is a narrative in history, there is a narrative in autobiography, and there is a narrative in films as well. But all narratives are not artistic. When we talk about artistic narratives, when we talk about literature, when we talk about novels or drama, or when we talk about other art forms, 
like films, like dance, like painting. So these are artistic narratives. And today's talk is going to focus on primarily literary narratives and film narratives. When we talk about these narratives, events do happen in time and space. Events do have a relationship of causality. But time in these narratives is not treated the way we find time it happens in our daily life. Art forms give a special treatment to time. Even if we think of 20th, uh, so 19th century realistic fiction, where we believe there is linear chronology, but time is not, we can say, faithful to the, to the reality of life. For example, a realist novel may tell us a story span of a character which spans into 20 years. Realist treatment of time, linear, linear chronology, novel belongs to the school of realism, will not give us minute details of each and every moment that a person does in, in those 20 years. It means artist is making a selection. What will appear in the narrative and what then what will not. And exclusion is taking place at some level and this Inclusion and exclusion plays a very important role in determining what the narrative means. Because when we study narratives, we do not study narratives just to study its structure. Understanding the structure is our first step towards understanding the discourse of the narrative and to understand the form of the narrative. Function. When we try to understand how narratives function, then we are trying to understand its grammar. Then we are trying to understand its poetics. Then we are dealing with, at some level, the aesthetics of narrative art. And our journey, intellectual journey, to engage with narratives at a different level is beginning. Fine, so we have discussed that there are different kinds of narratives. All narratives are not artistic. Among artistic narratives, there are literary narratives and there are film narratives. And story. And all narratives also give us arrangement of events in a particular time. And they are arranged in space. And there is a connection between them, which is called a connection of cause and effect, the causality. Time, space, and causality become very important. But when we talk about film narratives, no doubt time is important. And time can be handled with the help of editing. We know very it's, it's a common device which is used in films, especially in Hindi films, that there is a young boy who is running and there is a, the camera focuses on, on the feet of the young boy who is running and then suddenly that boy becomes an adult man. So that a time lapse of 20 years has been shown, ellipsis, which is called technical. So it means in, with the help of editing, a lapse of 20 years had been shown in the film. Time can be handled like that. Editing can take us back into time, flashbacks. Editing can also help us in jumping into future ellipses or other kinds of movements. That is one aspect of narrative. The other aspect which I'm going to focus today is, that is called space. Time and space, these are two important aspects of it, of narration. If events are arranged in time, that arrangement of events in time is studied under, under the section of story. What we study under the section of narration is that how things are narrated, what are different levels of narration, what is focalization, and in films, what role is played by camera and montage, which is called editing. So in my today's talk, I'm primarily going to focus on 
how camera narrates stories to us. Because what we need to understand is, if there is someone, A, who tells what B sees, and what B, what B sees, B sees what C is doing, this gives us the whole dynamics of, of narrative. A becomes the narrative, which tells us. B is the focalization. And C is the actor, the actant, one who is actually doing it. Now the question is, who tells us stories in films? Well, sometimes we have voiceover. And that voiceover becomes the narrator, the voice of the narrator. But after introducing the story, sometimes the voiceover disappears and the action begins. Who is telling the story then? And the voiceover never appears as a character. The presence of voiceover is only as voiceover. That is the voice of the narrator. Camera tells us the story. Now, the question is, how does the camera tell a story? I'll come to Fabula at the end of my talk. Now, the question is, how does camera tell us the story? And that is what I'm going to focus in this small talk. Camera has been equated with, with the pen of Fortius. Camera has also been seen as analogous to human eyes. Remember one thing, what we see on screen while watching a film, the selection made by camera is never innocent. It is never apolitical. It is not a matter of chance that it happened because when camera starts capturing the world, camera makes a selection that out of a large, big landscape, camera will focus only on one part of it. So when we see the world through the eye of the camera, we see a selected part of it. It's not the whole which is given to us. Perhaps the whole can be there in the, in the imagination of, uh, of the novelist. But that is never there what we see on screen. So camera gives us a slice of, of the real. And the real is transformed into, into the real. Now that image, cinematic image is screened before us. And we all are watching the a particular film. We may be watching on the laptops, we may be watching film in cinema halls, and there are maybe, hypothetically saying, 250 people sitting in a hall who are watching the same film, and there is one cinematic composition. It's not necessary that all 250 people will have the same understanding of the shot. And that is where Understanding films become more challenging sometimes than reading literature. Because when we read literature, we are conscious that we are reading something which is not meant to be taken literally. Like the use of language in literature is not literal. It is not for the denotative value of language we read literature. We are mentally prepared that we are reading something which stands for something else while reading poetry, while reading drama, while reading a novel, we look for the symbolic meaning. But when we watch a film, sometimes we simply accept the cinematic image for its face value. And that is where we commit a mistake. No doubt camera shows us the real world. No doubt camera shows us the real man in action. No doubt that camera shows us the real landscape. But what camera shows, what becomes part of the film, is now that belongs to the world of fiction. And in fiction, things stand for something else. And the meaning is, in a way, we can say, created by the artist by specific use of of its language. And that is where 
understanding the cinematic language is important for us. So when we watch a film, for example, if I simply run if this is if this is one shot, the way characters are arranged, the way it has been captured, the way camera angle has been used, all these things are part of the language of cinema. And space, which is that is called the screen space. And in this screen space, different characters are given different positions and they make different spatial configurations. And these, this spatial configuration is what the viewer responds to. Along with the visual, the sound is there. I'll talk about that later. It means when we see the real human beings, or real pictures, pictures of the real world, in a world work of fiction, it doesn't stand for reality. It's not a documentary that we are watching. It's not a news reel that we are watching. It's a work, work of fiction. And we need to understand how this arrangement of space and spatial configuration of characters, the use of screen space, ultimately contributes to the meaning of cinema. I told you that camera can be equated with, with the human eye. We need to understand the way we use our eyes. Well, when we simply have a cursory look at something, we don't focus on anything in particular. You may go to, go to the banks of Ganga, or you may go to a hill station, and you will have a cursory look at the, at the huge view in front of you that will be like extreme long shot. And then you suddenly see your friend is coming, and you have your entire friend's body from head to toe in your purview that gives you your long shot. And from their long shot, you focus on the mid part of your body, of your friend's body, from waist to head, and you are now moving towards the mid shot. Your friend approaches, comes near to you, you look at his or her face, you, that is closer. You shake hands, you talk to each other, you start paying attention to his or her features, eyes, nose, lips, what your friend is wearing. We are moving, this is called extreme close-up. So from extreme long short to extreme close-up, there are different possibilities that can be used. And the way a camera captures human subject on screen, the configuration it makes, that becomes important to understand That becomes important to understand that that what meaning the, the, the is the filmmaker trying to convey. I have lost my video. Yeah, here it is. Fine. So this spatial configuration of characters and spatial composition on the screen becomes a very important tool for us to understand the meaning that the filmmaker wants to convey. Along with these from extreme close up to extreme long shot, we have three important angles. First important angle is low angle shot. When we look at something from the low angle, the stature automatically looks bigger. The way we have most of the religious temples, churches, gurdwaras, mosques, they are placed at a higher pedestal. Higher, higher we look up, that elevates the status of God. And when we, we are at a high position, we tend to look down. So high angle shot looks down, literally looks down upon, upon the subject and diminishes its stature. So low angle tends to elevate and high angle tends to diminish. 
an eye level shot it's it's called democratic it maintains the status quo it does not disturb the status of the status of uh, of the subject so i'll play one clip and that will help you understand how the cinematic composition becomes important for us to understand the meaning that the filmmaker is trying to convey this is from film avara by raj kapoor मैं जानना चाहता हूं जज रघुनाथ तुम्हारे मन की अदालत का क्या फैसला है तुम्हारे मन की अदालत का क्या फैसला है दिस इज एक्सट्रीम क्लोज अप एंड दिस इज अ वर्क ऑफ एडिटिंग इन विच अ वेरी लिटरल translation of the phrase tumhare man ki adalat has been created by the filmmaker using the technique of superimposition <laughs> another camera goes back Now pay attention to the position of the camera in this scene. We know Raj Kapoor is the convict. He has been declared or pronounced convict by the court, and he asked Prithvi Raj Kapoor a question: "Ki aapke man ki adalat ka kya faisla? Aapke mutabik bunagar kaun hai?" Now look at this scene. How it has been captured. close up close up and he is judge ek judge aparathi se milne aaya ek bahut ek aparathi aparathi aap यूज ऑफ लो इन दॉर्ट हि उस बात के रसीब पर चपेटा पाकर के उसे खो बैठा जिसने अपने हाथों से अपनी बीवी का सुहाग उजाड़ दिया उस दुनिया के हाल पर जहां गरीबी की गोद में अपराध पलता है बाप के होते हुए भी लड़का अनाथ कहलाता है उम्र भर तरसता रहता कि कोई उसे बेटा देख कर पुकारे
Yes, anybody would like to make any observations on this scene? Anyone, feel free. Yourself and share your observations with me. Anything which you have noticed, which makes this scene special. Or no. Good afternoon. Yes. This is Mr. And yes, what he is, is that when he talks about the where the poor people get the hope and the hope of the father, then he is on a high angle. He is already shown from low angle because he is a convict. But when he says the bitter truth, he is on a high angle wale shot se dikhate from the window that is up there. Okay. Any other observation? Not wrong. Fine. Any other observation? See, uh, yes, somebody is saying, Nikita. Nikita, no, not you. Okay. Sorry. Not my, not my regular students. Okay. Yes. Anybody else? Especially from, from the host institution. See, I try to tell you that spatial composition is very important for us. If you recall the entire scene, when Prithvi Raj Kapoor goes to meet Raj Kapoor, Raj Kapoor is inside the cell and Prithvi Raj Kapoor is outside the cell. But the entire scene has been captured in such a way, you will find that it is not Raj Kapoor who is behind the, uh, behind the bars, rather it is Prithvi Raj Kapoor. Look at this. Here the meeting begins. With a low angle, he stands up, starts talking to him, and here. We know that it is this character who is in jail, and he is the judge, he is innocent, this character is convict, but the spatial composition is such, time and time again, Prithvi Raj Kapoor has been shown behind the bars. Uh, sir, like that. Chandrali wants to say something. Chandrali, you there? Uh, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll let yes. you speak. Give me a minute, please. It was this particular aspect of this scene which was very important. Rajapur is not shown behind the bars. It means this spatial composition, even if he's in jail, gives him relative freedom. There is some free space around him. That freedom is denied to, to Prithvi Rajapur. If you simply look at this composition, if I make the full screen, it looks as if he, this character is, is the convict and he's behind the bar. So if the filmmaker's attempt is to give this message that the real culprit is not one who has committed the crime, rather the real culprit is the one who has given him those circumstances. And then that person who is responsible for the circumstances is the real culprit culprit, according to the ideological position of the filmmaker. And that is what the filmmaker was trying to convey. Who is shown behind the bars is what was one important signifier in front of us. Yes, somebody was trying to say something. Chandrali, perhaps. Uh, good afternoon, sir. This is Chandrali. Yes. Uh, sir, as you had just pointed it out, I found really remarkable that the framing that was used in this scene uh, like you pointed it out that Prithvi Raj Kapoor was beyond the jail door, yet it appeared as if he is the one who is inside the jail and not Raj Kapoor. And what I find also remarkable is that they were showing Raj Kapoor from a quite low angle. Yes. So the idea was that though he is in captivity, he is the one who is also in power. And there's this one scene in between the clip that you played where Raj, Prithvi Raj Kapoor is... Uh, holding out his hands and Raj Kapoor is somewhere placed between it, yet he is beyond his reach. So it shows that even though his father might be powerful in reality, yeah. in this concern, in, you know, like he says, the monkey adalat, he is completely helpless. That's exactly. Your observations are very right, Chantrani. So what Thank it you. means, it means even if films show us, still films cannot 
describe things for us. And that is where I think a writer has a position of advantage, perhaps. Uh, a short story writer or a novelist can describe certain things and can also determine the reader's response to a large extent. So Pasa's story begins, one of his stories, which is called uh, The Broken Umbrella. That is uh, the title given to its in English translation. And the opening sentence of the story is that a particular lady, Madame Royal, is, is a frugal soul. She is quiver full of ideas to multiply her money. Two sentences. And these two opening sentences of the story nail the character for us. The moment we start reading the story, we, in a way, it fixes our position how to look at this lady, that she is frugal, she wants to save money, and she can go to any extent to save her money. It means in the rest of the story, whenever we will approach that character, the narrator has already fixed our position. A filmmaker cannot do that. Unless voice over comes. And since films is primarily a visual medium, good filmmakers have always felt that the use of voiceover should be minimum. The story through visuals. It means you have to make visual composition such that they should be revealing every aspect of the story of the character. And along with visual composition, what comes in films? That is dialogues. So you have to invent events, you have to invent dialogues, you have to think of different compositions in order to make certain cinematic phrases. And those cinematic phrases are what we, we are supposed to decode while watching the film. And that makes the job of a filmmaker more challenging sometimes because a filmmaker cannot simply tell us the way conventional or the way a literary uh, writer or a literary narrative can tell us. Now I will run an, another clip from Strategy Trace film Pastor Panchali and my attempt is to importance of sound in making meaning of film. And at the same time, we'll talk about other aspects of cinema today. This is one important scene from the film, Pasha Panchal. There is no other sound but some kind of buzzing. And pay attention to that. Durga is also paying attention to the buzzing sound. Apu follows her. The sound increases. Sound has gone down now. It is low. Now what you hear is the sound of nature. Wind. No use of dialogues, only visuals. Now another sound is appearing on the track.
two and a half minutes, and then there is first dialogue. Didi. Howling winds. The sound of what? nature. She hears something. And here comes in the tree. Chugging sound of the tree. It increases now. Train sound has increased. The sound of the howling wind is gone, completely gone. And the train dominates the, the screen as well. And smoke in the air. They come back to the house. Again, the signature tune is being played. What is Sataji Sri doing? I him to be a master craftsman. I think he has shown his skills in this particular scene. If you remember when the shot began, Apu's and Durga's mother was alone and the signature tune of Pacha Panchali was, was being played. Then both brother and sister, they go out and they are there in the field. And when they're close to the electric pole, the buzzing sound of electricity is dominating the soundtrack. And that is the sound of, in a way, modern technology, modernity. And that is juxtaposed with the sound of nature, the howling wind. And they are amidst, they're surrounded by nature completely. And there again, Another sound of technology comes, and that is train, the symbol of modernity. And Apu is both the children, especially Apu, they are wonderstruck. Then what is that thing? And they run towards the train. And the sound, the sound of the train dominates. And when the train comes, it dominates the entire screen as well. For any village boy or young village girl, back in the times when film was made, Seeing a train would not be an ordinary experience. They were not city children like you and me, or they were not metropolitan children, those who are familiar with the sounds of technology, the sounds of, of the city. They were village kids. And for them, seeing the train or seeing the electric pole were not their day-to-day -day or normal experiences. What does these small experiences have in the lives of these two children, those, these two characters in the film, primarily by using the sound signifier, not the visual signifier? This means that how sound is an important aspect of the cinematic image. When we understand the cinematic image, we are not simply supposed to pay attention to what is being shown to us. What is being shown to us, important thing is what we also hear. I'm only talking about sound and, and image, with sound, visual synchronization, which helps in making the meaning. Makers who use the sound and an image relationship in a more creative manner and that can be understood at a different plane. But how sound contributes to the cinematic image, that is what we need to understand. We must have seen that film. There is a film, there is a scene in which the woman is sitting in the kitchen and rice is boiling in front of her 
and the sound of boiling rice dominates the soundtrack, which becomes a signifier of her state of mind. That is how, along with the visuals, there are sometimes auditory signs which are present in the narrative, which the filmmakers want us to. These things cannot be written down. These things are performed. So film becomes, that is where performative art, why being narrative art? Literature is completely narrative art. There are dramatic elements only in the, in the form of dialogues. Otherwise, it is a narrator who is telling us a story. But in films, camera is the narrating agency. Camera is telling us a story. But camera shows us more than that. Of cinema does not end with what we see on screen. Rather, narration of cinema begins after what we have seen, what is there on the screen. For example, there is a film by Truffaut called The 400 Blows. The film is about a young boy who has family issues. He, is, he belongs to a disturbed, dysfunctional family, and which has given him behavioral problems as well. And because of certain reasons, that young boy is institutionalized. He runs away from, from the institution. And he runs away from the city. When he runs away, away from the city, camera follows him. He's running at, a, at his regular pace. Camera follows him. Camera shows him running. Camera shows his feet. He's gradually running and he goes, runs out of the city and he encounters the sea. Once he encounters the sea, first in this direction, then in the other, he has nowhere else to go, he turns back. And as he turns back, the frame freezes. There's a close-up, and the boy is looking directly into the camera, front shot, and that shot is frozen. That becomes the last shot of the film. And that frozen frame, as we discuss a lot, because that opens up the narrative to multiple interpretations. Who? Oh, what does it mean? Does it mean that the boy has nowhere else to go? He will have to come, come back to the city? Will he have to come back to the same social system that he was unhappy with? Or that young boy is asking a question to the audience that you tell me now, where should I go? I'm living here. So, this is how multiple questions can be raised by a single shot, which is simply frozen in time and space. But narration continues. Film might have stopped. Movement in terms of time and space might have stopped there, but that single frame of the film was eloquent enough to open the film to multiple interpretations. That is the beauty of cinematic compositions. That is the beauty of cinema. It's so simply not telling us what camera records mechanically. Camera is the tool through which they write their stories, through which they convey their meanings, through which they share the world with us. We need to understand it is that we need to decode. If the first scene that I show you from Raj, Raj Kapoor's Avara, the position of camera was telling us that who is the real culprit according to the filmmaker. Then Satyajit Ray is giving us a work of cinema in which there is hardly any dialogue. A scene which is perhaps more than three minutes long, there are only two dialogues. Called Didi. Second, he asks her, what is that? And she doesn't know what's that. And she evades the answer and then comes in the train. But through that, those two young kids from a particular background, being exposed to the world of modernity, they have experienced what modernity is, two important signifiers, electric poles and train. They are being introduced to a new world. And when they are being introduced to a new world, signature possibility tune is not being played. In sound of electricity, the sound of technology, juxtaposed with the howling sound of winds, the sound of nature, which is again juxtaposed with 
the sound of train. It means if Satyajit Ray is using long shots, maybe, but he's creating a montage of a sound. One sound is juxtaposed, juxtaposed with another sound, and we come to know that how they are experiencing different worlds in that particular small expression that brother and sister have given. It's an important part of the film now I would like to show you another clip of this film, which will help you understand that how editing in simple terms play a role. In and after that, I'll show you one clip for to understand montage, and then I'll stop because I know I don't have much time at my disposal. This is from the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is the famous last scene. Here comes in the third element. Two can take a lot quicker than one. You're not taken. Mid short is juxtaposed with mid short. And the use, use of editing is very important. Close up. Close up. Why? Long shot. I'll tell you why. There's nothing in there. You thought I'd trust you? thousand dollars a lot of money. We're going to have to earn it. Extreme close up, extreme close up. Ah. Extreme close up. Again, the same long shot. Write the name on the bottom of this stone. Again. Now begins the drama. Look at their arrangement, triangle, a competition between three competitors, a Mexican composition, and how it changes. They are taking their positions. And editing shows us the dynamics among these three characters. How they look at each other, look into each other's eyes. And they are getting ready for the tour. He is looking at his pistol. His eyes were focused on his pistol. This is extreme long shot. giving us the blocking of characters in this screen space and the triangle is finally found. And after 
after this extreme long show, Try to understand. Here is one character. This is another. This is third. Fourth one is camera. And the audience identifies with that case. Similar kinds of shot for three competitors, point of view shot, point of view shot, point of view shot. All three are looking at others. Close up, pistol. Second man's pistol, his hand. Third man's pistol, his hand. Now focus will be on the eyes. It's zooming in further. Slowly, hand is going towards the pistol. He observes. He is observing other two. Everyone is observing the eyes. And you will find each cut is taking place at a regular regular interval, which gives rhythm to the entire scene. Extreme close up, extreme close up. Fast paced auditing. That is where we find that how editing contributes, not merely to increase the drama. Every cut, I think filmmaker was contributing towards a statement. If you have to write this scene, you will write in detail. And in while writing in detail, you will write the emotions, the things which were going on in their mind, thinking what they were planning, how they were observing the other competitors. But the filmmaker has to show this drama in the undercurrents with the help of visuals. And that is where what we see on the screen is only a text. What we need to engage with is the subtext of, the, of any text, especially while reading, uh, while reading a film or while analyzing a film. In the subtext of, of Patri Panchali, the encounter was between the old world and the new world. In the subtext of this scene, there was a lot of tension. There the filmmaker was trying to show with the help of editing. Satyajit Ray tried to show the encounter with the help of, of sound. And Raj Kapoor tried to show the subtext drama with the help of camera positions. So whether it is 
editing, whether it is use of sound, whether it is use of composition, mise-en-scene and montage. They are two important terms for us in order to understand narration in, in cinema. One is mise-en-scene, the second is montage. When we talk about different camera angles, composition of screen, what is there, the way uh, we can say what is put in a scene is mise-en-scene. The composition that we see on the screen, different camera shots, camera angles which have been used, use of lighting, they all contribute to mise-en-scene. And montage is what we what is achieved with the help of editing. But every work of editing is not montage. Montage is when certain things are edited, different shots are cut and juxtaposed in such a way that it results into the formation of the third meaning. Only then it, it can be called montage. I'm uh, running short of time, so I will have to stop. But there is a famous example of Battleship Potemkin. And you can watch that scene. That's how montage is achieved. Montage is maybe for students of literature, John Dunn's metaphysical conceits. There are two images, and there is no direct logical connection between those two images. But when they are put together, when they're juxtaposed with each other, third meaning emerges out of it. And that is why montage is also called the dialectic shock. So, this dialectical way of thinking that there is thesis and antithesis and it results into something new. That way of filmmaking was promoted by a Russian filmmaker, especially Eisenstein and Podovkin. And French filmmakers, they were the supporters of, 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 of the school of long shots, that is the school of mise-en-scene. Both are different ways of storytelling. Both different ways give us different codes that we have to decode that we have to understand. It means engagement of a viewer while watching the film is not passive. If screen space gives us one composition, which was first conceived by the filmmaker, what we encounter is the text. Filmmaker is not there to explain to us. And the readers engage with the, with the, uh, with the filmic composition. And the engagement with the screen space, the text of the film and the reader creates another kind of space in which this interpretation takes place. And that is why when I talk about different levels of, uh, of, of narrative analysis, I say first is story, second is narration, third is fabula. I'll tell you what these terms are and then I will stop. Story is arrangement of events in time as it is written. Narration is different levels and kinds of narration, whether there is character, uh, narrator is present in the narrative or na narrator is outside the narrative, who is the focalizer, whether the focalizer is present in the narrative or the focalizer is outside the narrative, how camera focalizes, how camera narrates through mise-en-scene and montage. I've just touched upon a couple of important aspects of camera narration. And then third aspect is fabula. Understand one thing, whenever we read a novel, or whenever we watch a story, arrangement of story can be different from, in a narrative can be different from the actual story, what we call plot. What is the actual story? It's something reader deciphers, reading or watching the whole narrative. So reconstruction of events is the is the result of activity of the reader, reader of a film and reader of novel. So story, the actual story, events which must have taken place in reality, that is the result of the cognition of readers. So reader ultimately decides for himself and herself what the story is. In a film, in, in film narration, filmmaker may be using mise-en-scene and montage but they are decoded by the viewers. And every film viewer can decode a filmic composition in a different way. The way a couple of you responded to the cin cinematic composition in Avatar. 
and you were responding in a two or three individuals responded and they were responding in different ways and that is where i think film analysis of film narratology empowers the readers which makes it kind of post structuralist position which i have taken that narrative may be there text may be there but it is reader who comprehends it it is it is reader who deconstructs it it is readers who interprets it so all these spaces of interpretation hermeneutic activity they are the result of the readers engagement with the text which opens up the text to maybe to we can say to to further possibilities then i have written three terms here place setting and space if events are arranged in time and space ideally space should have been written here yes but why i have written space along with fabula along with readers activities because there are two different dimensions of space one is where the action is taking place that is called place that is called location setting means what is the sociological context for example we have a novel set in london in the 19th century that has one particular setting then there can be another novel set in london in the 20th century it will have a different setting because 19th century london is different from 20th century london these are two different spaces and this third dimension of space is produced by human activity that is the production of space which is the result of human intervention so things which are happening in the 19th century london are different from the things which are happening in the 20th century london these are two same places but two different settings and two different spaces and when reader engages with these spaces another kind of space is produced which is the result of a harmony so i understand narratives at the level of time and space levels and kinds of narration and in that my attempt was to focus on primarily on the function played by camera in the film narration in which mise en scene and montage are two important schools and fabula is the third dimension of space in which readers activity hermeneutic activity reconstruction of events readers engagement with with, with the cinema space in order to decode it and interpret it all that opens up the cinematic space to further space of uh, of interpretation where ideological interventions will also take place so all that that i study under the category of fabula with this i'll stop and if you have any doubts any questions you're most welcome i'll try to answer there is one question on uh, yes besak besaki chatterjee yes. maybe you can help me with the questions which question yes, i should answer first yes so uh, so bhai chandrali mukherjee for a discussion sure good afternoon sir good afternoon it was wonderful seeing this session and interacting with you and you. uh what we really find admirable was the fact that you explained narrative structures with the help of three most important devices with the help of camera with the help of sound you were also going to engage us with the montage that we see in the odessa sets of battleship potemkin it's unfortunate that we couldn't see it today but it would have been lovely to see us inside in that order sir i would like to ask you a very brief explanation of how would you explain the montage scene in battleship potemkin by Einstein do you remember the thing the odessa steps sir yes do you remember uh, like i i would just like you to explain how that went on to change the course of cinema completely i think with that particular scene in the odessa steps when everybody is running in how did that change what do you think that changed the way auteurs filmmakers used to interact with their audience how did that change the style of the visual suzette do, do you remember that scene so of battleship potemkin yes yes i do i do i vividly remember fine 
So when the scene begins, what's the mood? It's it's quite tense. Before that, it is there is celebration. Indeed, indeed, sir. Fine. Yes, yes. And then, then school courses enter. Mm. And when people are happy, when they are celebrating, mm. so camera focuses on individual faces indeed. and show them individually that how happy they are. Mm. And then, in extreme long shots, it also shows mm. the shapes. And then, when the state forces enter, police mm. enters and starts firing on the crowd, it results into chaos. Indeed. And when that chaos is shown, mostly the individuals are sh shown in in close-ups, and cut cut one person, cut second person, cut third person, and their expressions, isolating them, Indeed. isolating them in, in in a situation of chaos, and. When the state forces are shown, time and time again, camera is placed at such a position that guns are pointing towards the people. Indeed. Either marching feet are shown or guns are shown. So mm -hmm. this is the kind of cynic dashi which is used in cinema. That mm -hmm. one part stands for the whole. Mm -hmm. Marching feet standing for for the soldiers, and then soldiers standing for the state. Yes. The power of the state. Oh. And then, how the conflict between the state forces and ordinary people that is shown with the help of editing, which makes it wonderful. Right. Every individual is almost left alone. Mind whether it's a small boy going, family yes. is uh, rolling down, rolling down. Right? or whether it's it's a small small child who is being trampled over by other by the mob. Find then the lady who picks up the child and face encounters the forces, and then when the scene ends, charge off of three different langa, and that rising of rising three images of lions rising up signify that 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 the people have risen up, the uprising of the people. So. When the battleship Potemkin was made, yes, sound was uh, dialogues weren't there in the film. Yes. So the attempt of the filmmaker to tell story was montage using editing. Fine. We cannot say that when montage is a primary mode of story narration, camera angle or camera shots do not play an important role. They do. Primary emphasis on is on editing. And then the last uh, shot in which those, those lines are shown, getting up, rising up. Mm. That, uh, otherwise it was not connected with the things which were happening. But the, mm. the way they are arranged, it gives us an order as if actually a line is rising up, and the rising up of the line, putting when it is put in the entire context, well, it it means. That the uprising is taking place now. The revolution is happening. So that is how filmmakers they use editing in order to to, to convey. Uh, I I I have another question. For you. Yes. Not a question, rather. I would like to ask you for a suggestion that for students of literature uh, who intend to study the narratives of films, how hmm. do you think they should approach it? Because visual storytelling is completely different from the written storytelling that we encounter. So, so first how thing, should one tackle it? Is what I think. I have I have always felt that students of literature are at a position of advantage while reading film narratives, because we are all the time dealing with narratives. When we read novels, no student of literature engages only with the plot. You know, symbols are there in novels as well. Sometimes description can have a symbolic value. Sometimes certain things that Character does in the narrative can have a symbolic value. So students of literature are at a position of advantage to decode symbols in the narrative. Mm -hmm. What's important is that while we are engaging with film narratives, first of all we should understand the language of cinema. Mm -hmm. And when we try to understand the language of cinema, we must understand. How camera is used, how lighting is used, how sound is used, 
what role editing does. Ultimately, the whole storytelling in cinema is taking place use of these tools. Once we understand the language of cinema, then you can start engaging with with, with the narrative of films also. And uh, sir, we also seem to find this approach that a lot of people have that when you claim that you're a student of literature and you intend to work with cinema, which itself is one of the finest achievements of human civilization, I feel, there is a sort of um, prejudice, I would say, against how, how could you academically approach something that is as popular as cinema? That is the idea behind it. I know. And uh, how, how should one deal with it when they intend to pursue so cinema as an academic approach? When we are dealing with films for, uh, for, for any academic purpose, we cannot ignore the fact that films belong to popular culture. Fine. It means we must engage with the issues of high art and low art. And if a literary classic is being adapted into cinema, the first thing that we is how so-called literary high art is being adapted into, into popular culture. Why I'm saying so-called literary high art? Because we don't realize that when Shakespeare used to present his plays, when he used to perform his plays, he also used to cater to the popular sensibility. He had philosophical contents. He, his plays are profound. But at the same time, he had something for the popular, for the masses as well. Let us look at how novels emerged. Novels also emerged with the rise of the middle class when early novel was being written, which was not considered to be a genre for the elite. It's a medium of mass communication. It was. And, and Charles Dickens novels, we know they were published in, 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 in journals and newspapers. So they were part of the, of, of, the, of the mass culture of his times. And from there, because there was artistic worth in his narratives, yes, these days those novels stand as literary classics. So my first advice would be that don't approach films with a bias that it's a popular film. So there can't be anything profound in it. Hmm. Film, so everything is profound about it. We need to come out of this binary within cinema as well. There is art cinema and there is popular cinema. We should only engage with this idea whether the filmmaker understands the language of cinema or not. How intelligently the language of cinema has been used. Yes, I agree when we engage engage with films like uh, Indian New Wave or certain new low-budget films which are being made these, these days, uh, their approach is different. The way they look at social problems, that is different. If they give us a solution, that is different. So that is where we can engage with. That whether Amitabh Bachchan's angry young man, what kind of angry young man is he? Or then there is another angry young man in films like Ard Satya, what kind of angry young man he is. Then we can compare it with the concept of angry young man as we find in literature. So let's not dismiss popular cinema altogether. After all, Rajkutu was also part of mainstream cinema. Hmm. And Gurudat, Rajkutu, Bhimal Roy, Chetan Anand, they are considered to be pioneers of Indian movies. So these people have made films which were socially relevant. At the same time, Raj Kapoor was part of mainstream cinema. All mainstream films may not be socially that engaging. I understand. But at the same time, when we talk about books, all books are not literary classics. When we go to a bookstore, there are a number of, a number of uh, um, say, and, and kinds of books are there. Some are popular fiction, some are literary classics, some are pulp fiction, some are astrology books, some are crime thrillers, and we pick classics, and the best of literature is sometimes, sometimes, not always, sometimes is compared with the worst of cinema. And then we say that cinema is not good. No, it's that particular filmmaker who is not good. We know there are films in the world cinema, including Indian cinema, which are great work of art. 
It means cinema is an art form. It depends two things. One, how the filmmaker approaches cinema. How, what do we expect of cinema as viewers? Do I approach cinema only for entertainment? Or do I expect something more? So instead of approaching cinema with a bias, I think we should approach films with an open mind and try to engage with each and every film in which we And let's try to understand what's happening in the film. That's all. Thank you so much, sir. I would ask Desaki to take over from here. Yeah, sure. Desaki, are you there? Hello. Yes, I am. Yes. Thank you so much. We have a question by Mridu Sharma. Mm -hmm. can, we, can we call autobiography and film adaptations of great people as the life narratives of these people? Is it the correct term to use for a literature and for film scholar? Is it written somewhere? Mridu Sharma. Can we call autobiography and film of people as the life narratives of these people? Is it the correct term to use for a literature and film scholars? See, we have a term like biopic. And biopic means a film which tells the story of one individual. And we can approach films, whether it is an autobiographical film or a biographical film, as biopics. But a verbal biography written in words cannot be called a biography. We'll have to call it biography or autobiography, but both are, yes, you can call them life narratives. They are. The differences of medium. One is depending on the visual, visual medium, the other is depending on the verbal medium. I hope I have answered your question. Thank you, sir. And the next question. Yes, sir. Oh, please carry on. Yes. Okay. The next question is by Diptarup Ghosh Dastidar. Do you find the comics form as being closer to the medium of films when put in perspective of literature, given that even Satyajit Ray framed his screenplays in the form of comics? Could you delineate points of similarity between the two forms? Uh are you talking about comic strips? If that is your question, see, we can find some kind of connection, and that is the connection of visuals. But films are not only visuals, films are more than that. I'm aware that Satyajit Ray also used to make drawings of each and every shot that he would take. It means that he would imagine his, his film, his film composition make a sketch of it, and then the shooting would be good. But we can read comic strips, we can read film narrative, films, we can walk, look at even animations for that matter as different kinds of narratives. Comic strip in the form of printed pictures cannot be called a film, but that can be called a narrative. Cinema is a different institution, it operates differently, it's multimedia in nature, perhaps a comic strip in printed form, picture in, in the form of pictures is not multimedia in that way. Both are, both are narrative forms, that, that's there. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Priyanka, ma'am. Sir, mm -hmm. as you said about the effect of sound in Potter Patali, in the same line of thought, silent movies like Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Four for Horseman of Ap Apocalypse, etc., were very potent and successful in representing the emotion, mood, and message. If you kindly elaborate it more. See, if we look at a film like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, it belongs to the school of German expressionism. In order to understand the aesthetics of that film, first you need to understand the aesthetics of German Expressionist art or painting. Song was not present at that time. That film was made in 1910s, in the second decade, 
around 1920, 1920. Expressionism started around 1914-15. The cabinet of Dr. Kennedy was made in 1919, 1920. Song wasn't there. But important thing is that these films are abstract. The Maison saying the composition of that film does not give us an illusion of reality. It does not create the effect of verisimilitude. We know that if there is a there is a heart with an oblique arch, if there is a stool which is extraordinarily long, and the person with, who is sitting on the top of it gives him an and an awkward position of superiority over the others, then everything, the entire aesthetics of German expressionism was not meant to be realistic. No doubt they were conveying moves. And expressionist art was more interested in conveying anxieties, fears, human emotions, expressing the inner world. So that mise-en-scene symbolizes or the anxieties of, uh, of maybe German nation after the loss of First World War? Yes, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari does that. So whether it is cabinet uh, of Dr. Caligari or four horsemen of apocalypse, it's not that mood is always conveyed with the help of sound. When sound was added to films, when films began to talk, it was an added advantage to the filmmakers that now they could also express certain moods, certain ideas using sound. So sound became additional signifier to the, to the visual signifier. I hope that I have answered your question. Thank you, sir. I on behalf of intersections. Just a second. Yes, I'll, sir. Uh, just yes, sir. Yes, sure. some, uh, two minutes thought with Vivek. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, okay, uh, sir. Thank sure. you, Vivek, uh, Professor Sachdeva, sir, for coming uh, uh, with us uh, for two hours engaging lecture. And uh, the purpose to ask you to come and to talk with us is this that we don't have any film studies course in our PG final year. And after that, students go for research, so they don't even consider film. And as, as Chandrali was, like she mentioned, most of the institutes dismiss the work on film as a popular or something not to be considered as a part of a literature department. I'm sure that you uh, know all this about. So what, what we wanted to do in this uh, COVID-19 when people were sitting home, exposing my students to uh, different areas, different fields, which they can explore for research and also think for engaging with uh, as a project or uh, or let's say anything they would like to do in future as well, or they want to generate the interest, right? I mean, uh, if you see the old, uh, um, I mean, any departments, if you see generally what we have in India, leaving very selective few, uh, we have post-colonial theory where we still talk about Said and Spivak and then Bhava and it's over. And then suppose if we go on feminism, then we have Virginia Woolf, Ellen So Walter, and then it's over, right? So the point is that still we are not able to come out of it. So therefore, what I wanted uh, to do is that engaging with the, with the different thoughts. So I'm extremely happy that professor like you could come uh, online and speak to us because generally when we were uh, uh, planning this out with my students, so uh, they had an issue like, sir, kya ye log ready honge hamare saath, uh, engage hone mein, right? Because uh, like they have some other uh, work and uh, they are busy with their own schedule. I said, no, I mean, uh, if, uh, uh, I mean, like we know certain uh, professor who, uh, who love to talk with us, who love to engage with us, and they genuinely understand the problem that we go through. So uh, what I realized, and I have been talking to my friends, that people like you, uh, what, the, uh, 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 what are the important things that we need to learn from uh, people like you is, obviously, after a point of time, we can read books, but more important is the kind of perspective and attitude that you guys have built up after a point of time. So... Uh, 
like i i i i'm just putting my heart out before you right like i'm just telling you what i personally feel is this that there are professors like you know that uh, they don't want to talk they don't want to discuss uh, uh like let's say for example just now i got a, a, ma- a message from my friend that he is so prepared for this talk right i mean to say that he uh, what he said that he, that he has not taken this uh, platform very lightly when he is engaging with the students right so generally we have a certain uh a certain idea in our mind that when we are calling someone what if right what if they think oh it's okay they are just pg students all right i'll uh, convey some idea then it's over so like this is a uh, this is my students are listening and i'm sure that they are going to be the future professor please 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 more than academic things like what you are going to get from books is also important that what kind of personality you build up how approachable you are how humble and polite and how professional you are what the work you are doing right you you are not like going to disappoint anyone right so you give your best and this is exactly what i'm extremely thankful to professor vivek sasdeva because when i was uh, talking over the conversation i asked vivek sasdeva and i still remember i'm sharing with friends uh, like my students and friends that he called me up and he said that what your students actually want do they want to listen this or this so i was just thinking that he is so sincere about the project that what he is going to speak should be meaningful to our students right so this is this is what i want from my student uh, to think about it at the same time when they are reading books uh, and uh, most of our students are because they are going to have exam on 10th and 11th like few of them have exam tomorrow and then few of them have exam day after tomorrow so they uh, dropped me a text by saying that sir please uh, uh, record the lecture so that we can watch on the youtube it seems to me that one of my uh, student called me and she said sir i got to know that he is also talking about the camera and he is also talking showing some clips it is extremely interesting so uh, please please do record i don't want to miss that so so they are curious and and i am sure that uh, once they listen to your lecture i am sure that they are going to improve and vivek uh, just one request if i next time i call you please don't say no to me all right <laughs> that, that that is just to say that's why i promise to you i will never say no to your students <laughs> thank you so much and uh, uh, yes go on no please carry, please carry on you were saying something you no i was just about to say that uh, uh, this could become successful because uh, Uh, i have certain students who have not shown their face in last 14 to 15 lectures but they have been uh, incessantly working behind let's say for example i really want to name one person is pragya dev uh, she is ma final year student she created posters uh, and uh, uh, she is so sincere that <laughs> i said to one ski we want to uh, record the youtube uh, on youtube so that other can also see and they can go back and uh, look at if they have missed some glitches so uh, she worked she did research she took the help from others so i'm extremely thankful to uh, pragya because uh, because of her it would have not been uh, successful and obviously manas who has also done a lot of posters before but last two times uh, uh, he has some uh, issue technical issues with his mobile phone and obviously uh, like baisakhi and others uh, and other students i don't want to name one by one because then what happened vivek you know kisi ka naam chhut gaya right so it is also no i don't want to give any formal lot of thanks but i really uh, indebted to you guys and uh, we are always there for you and obviously audience you are awesome right like like you guys are great that is what i can say right? like like your uh, dedication and devotion so we i just want to mention one thing more now when i came to bhu just i want to say over here i i know that i'm boring my uh, students no no not at all not at all <laughs> when i came over here uh, because i was in iflu for my uh, p uh, from my phd okay so the class uh, like you know i'm sure that you must be knowing uh, madhav prasad uh, sushi tharun and etc so they used to deliver lecture for 2 hours right so uh, uh, i did my pg from bhu so i thought that how difficult it would be to sit for 2 hours right to listen to someone for 2 hours that is to not to watch a movie but to listen a lecture so when i came to bhc i thought that i'll make sure that my student are sitting for 2 hours to listen a lecture 
Mm-hmm. And I'm delighted to see that uh, they are they are they, they are now accustomed. They are habituated. They are trained. Trained will be more mechanical words, but I'm, I I would like to say that now they have habituated themselves. They have conditioned themselves to listen. Also, they have generated interest to listen the lecture for two hours. So this is the first thing I tell you, Vivek, was in my mind, right? That I will ensure this later on. I will work on other things. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, uh thank you and i will not bore you so vivek i will have your uh, some words and then i'll ask besaki to go for formal word of thanks yeah thank you vivek thanks for sharing your emotions with me and with your students uh i would like to respond to the challenge that you talked about in the beginning that in the department sometimes you are not able to go beyond post colonial studies or feminist studies and it's difficult to work on films then i think you can explore new areas of work under the banner of cultural studies we it's high time that the binary between the high art and low art should be broken it should be questioned at least and by challenging this binary we are not trying to undermine the worth of what we call the high art but only attempt it to maybe Read the argument of the of the low art, but we think a low art is not so low. It it also has some artistic worth. It also engages with certain social issues. It also responds to things which hap- uh, happening around us in the society, and it is worth why it's worth uh, getting our critical attention. So within cultural studies, you can talk work on various areas and. Film studies is one. Then working on folklore can be another. Then there are so many other cultural practices which can which can find in your own city. So cultural studies can open up the the area of uh, the kinds of topics you work on, the areas of interest, or the area of areas of specialization that students, young scholars, would like to build. And that would only contribute to the nature of literary studies in India. It's not going to to affect it adversely. about lecture <laughs> i think uh, i i still remember uh, it w- i was in the early years of my teaching career and i was attending a conference i made a presentation on khamosh pani i still remember and a very senior professor who had retired from the department almost 10 years back he came to me he congratulated me for my talk and then he said that we wait you whatever you do ultimately what matters in life is what we deliver in the classroom so i think this is one lesson which i am still carrying with me i i i haven't forgotten his words and that is one thing i would like to tell these budding scholars and who are going to be uh, academics teachers somewhere in colleges or university departments that ultimately what matters the most is what we deliver in the classroom our personal research should only enrich our classroom teaching if it doesn't enrich our classroom teaching then our personal research carries no value too fast give respect and lots of love to your students nothing can be maybe i can say a better experience than that and thanks for sharing your sentiments with me i yeah yeah just one thing like uh, i just reminded of something I was teaching in Aligarh. I mean, uh, the first break I got in acad- like as an assistant professor in Aligarh Muslim University. Mm-hmm. So we had an induction program for just for five days. So okay. so there was a professor from MBA and he was asking that what you'd like to do in future, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So uh, what you said exactly was told to me by Professor Dilip Das in Culture's Department from IFLU. Okay. He and said the pro- same- Professor M L Vaina who said to me. <laughs> okay and he said the same thing like he that your research matter but the first thing that you are supposed to focus on your teaching you are just a first a teacher so yes. your dedication and your commitment to students is 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 going to be uh, like make you it will make you happy so uh, this is exactly what i said that uh, the first thing that i would like to do in my entire life as a teacher is that to teach my students research comes later for me and teaching uh, as a profession comes first to me thank you uh, basaki take over thank you sir i on behalf of intersections extend profound gratitude 
to all those who have assisted in achieving such a pronounced outcome of this lecture. Firstly, I must mention our deep sense of appreciation and sincere thanks to our chief speaker, Dr. Vivek Sachdeva. Thank you, sir, for your reinvigorating and intriguing talk on workshop on film and narratology. With the help of such gripping visual instances. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to Dr. Vivek Singh. Sir, it's solely because of your motivation, support, and guidance extended to all of us that we are able to hear such preeminent and prestigious intellectuals. I also extend my thanks to all the participants for their gracious presence and enormous cooperation throughout. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good luck to bye -bye. all of you. Stay safe. Bye-bye. 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 Take care.